Good morning, this is Anna Melia from Northeast Animal Rights. Just gonna show you the banner so you can see it. <laughs> um, we're doing another interview today as part of our Saturday Spotlight Fortnightly series. And today we have the fabulous Jill Robinson, who is the CEO and founder of Animals Asia. So I'd like to say good morning to, to Jill. And we're going to we're going to we'll have some questions for you. It's just sort of a conversation, and obviously we'll find out a lot about Animals Asia th uh, through the through the course of the of the chat as well. Okay. So I know Animals Asia was founded in 1998, but you started rescuing animals before then, uh, bears in 1994. So how did you work in those earlier days and securing sanctuary for the animals you rescued? And how did you become aware that bears needed rescuing? And how, can you describe the first rescue you were successful with? I know it's quite a lot there, but it's just kind of around the first sort of like setting up the you know setting the scene yeah no hi Anna thank you so much for the opportunity um goodness those days seem a long time ago now um as you say 1994 actually everything began in 1993 um I'd already been working for the International Fund for Animal Welfare since the mid-1980s as their Asia consultant or Asia representative and um in 93 I got a call from a journalist friend who um, had just come back from a bear bar farm in China. And he just said, Jill, you need to go along. And I, at that time I was doing a lot of undercover investigations. So looking at the dog trade, I was looking at animals in traditional medicine. I was going to, you know, South Korea, the Philippines, China. Um, and, you know, when I got this call from my friend, my interest was piqued and I thought, uh, you know, he, he said that he'd just come back from one of these awful bear farms that, you know, where they're milked for their bile and the bile is used in traditional medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, and I thought, gosh, yes, I'll go over to the mainland and, and have a look and see what, what was going on. So I went over there um, with a couple of friends and um, we came up, we found the bear farm and then we found the stairs that led down to the basement area below where they were keeping the bile bears. So at the, at the, at the main part of the farm, they were keeping breeding animals, um, which were in an OK you know, condition. They weren't being extracted for their bile. But when we went down into the basement area, we saw the bears in tiny wire cages, um, so small they could hardly move, um, with catheters sticking from their abdomens, I guess around you know, the size of that pen. Um, and this was used to extract the bile on a daily basis. And at that time, I mean, I'd never seen anything so shocking. And um, I, as I was walking around, obviously just so fearful and, and, and upset by what I'd seen, I backed it too closely into a cage and I just felt something touch my shoulder. And I turned around and actually a, a bear had her paw through the bars of the cage. And as I say to everyone today, it was the most reckless thing I've ever done, you know, but it, her paw was there just reaching out and I took it and she didn't hurt me as you know we would never do that today we rescued over 630 bears and you never would take a bear by the paw especially one you know that on a bear bile farm that is so afraid of, of people but I took it and she just squeezed my fingers and you know I had just the most um I just deeply deeply touching message from her and I left that farm I think knowing that I'd never see her again and I didn't but um I just wondered you know to this day I, you know she, she started everything. She started the dream of the China Bear Rescue and she certainly changed everything about my life as well. Um, and, and that was it really, you know, we still with I4, we were talking with the, with the government about the industry and we got an opportunity to cut a long story short to rescue um, nine bears from the second farm that I then went to see. Um, and we built a very small sanctuary in Southern China and then years later, um, when I was no longer with I4 and we'd started Animals Asia and started rescuing bears, um, I4 then um, passed over the ownership of those bears or some of those bears remaining to us at our sanctuary in Chengdu. So it's long story short. No, no, it's fascinating. I, I, I felt quite moved actually when you were telling me about the, the bear as well. It's just so such a, um, it's just it's just so, I can't, I can't begin to imagine what it was like. It must have been absolutely awful. Um, I mean, I hope she's, I, I hope she's passed away now, Anna, you know, because I can't bear the thought that all these years later, she's still suffering on that bear farm when we've rescued so many other bears, you know, but she was there for a reason. I'm sure of that today. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the, what's the age span? What's, what's the lifespan of a, of a, of a normal bear then? Uh, anything up to about 30 years, actually, or more, if you have them, you know, as we have at the rescue centres and you're able to medicate them and care for them, you know, but in the wild around 30 years. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
your, your, so animalization, your three areas of campaigning at the moment are a bear bile farming, which you've just you've talked about a little bit, the cat and dog trade uh, for meat and captive animal welfare as well. They're all massive areas on their own. Um, so can you, can you tell us a little bit about each area and how you, you work in to improve the lives of the animals you, could, you come across? Yeah, sure. Well, we work in mainly um, China and Vietnam with all of our programmes. Um, and just to briefly on the captive animal welfare, it's run by our fantastic animal welfare director, Dave Neal, who's also based in the UK. I hope you get the chance to talk to him because he's doing groundbreaking work now in both countries in terms of just upskilling, you know, you know, people like keepers um, in zoos, for example, um, you know, to be able to look at the animals they house in a more compassionate and, you know, better management way. Um, he's also in Vietnam, especially, has embarked on a fantastic elephant rescue program, taking elephants that were previously used for riding for the tourist industry um, and now seeing them in free in the forest um, together with their, you know, with the mahouts as well. And just providing funding that is and is actually supported by um, the Olsen Animal Trust that's also based in the UK and they've been helping us superbly well for the elephant program um, mm. now uh, in Vietnam. Um, Dave is also working on things like you know um, animal performances and convincing the country you know not to be attending these awful places mm. and just seeing them close down as well as a result of his work. Mm. Um, I mean it's a it's a it's a hugely complex um, issue and, and projects that he's running but he's making such inroads now and especially of course in the schools you know um, with projects you know going to the school children for example one's called not born to perform um, and you know and getting kids to refuse to go to animal performances um, and getting you know using their artist art, artistic expertise to design posters that are displayed in universities and schools across the country so all of our programs are really really holistic you know they cover lots of different areas so that we can sort of round in it's right you know, it's the case of not pointing a finger and saying you shouldn't be doing this you shouldn't be doing that but but really um as i say convincing by kindness i get it i guess it is you know and pragmatism um that these are practices that really deserve to be relegated to the history books of shame um and the same with cat and dog welfare that's run by suki who's who's based in uh, china in Chengdu. And um, this again is, you know, is, it was set up to prevent dogs and cats being um, slaughtered as food for the table. Um, but of course, it's much more wide than that. Um, it's sort of, you know, talking to the community about the benefits of living in harmony with cats and dogs in society. Um, it's introducing programs like um, Dr. Dog and Professor Paws, which sees dogs going into hospitals and disabled centres with their fantastic um, um, you know, owners, um, and also uh, dogs going into schools as well. And this is like teaching children um, about responsible dog ownership, about how to, if they haven't got dogs as, as pets or as companions, um, how to approach dogs safely in the streets. And this is in a country with the second highest incidence of rabies, by the way. Um, it's, it's teaching children to enhance their English la language learning or their Chinese language learning as well, because they actually read to the dogs. Um, and the dogs, of course, are non-judgmental, just sitting there listening to the children <laughs> happily reading. Um, and it's just showing that unconditional love that dogs can offer, you know, into the community. And the kids, while they're doing all the reading and they're enhancing their English, uh, or they're Chinese. The reading material is all about the world around them, about animal welfare, um, you know, about how to treat um, animals more more respectfully, if you like. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah sorry. <laughs> it's such a good way to, to kind of like to, to do it with, with the children because I, I'm doing some stuff with Animal Aid, um, like the school speaker program, and, uh, and I've got some bookings for primary schools. I mean, I don't know how it's going to work with COVID at the moment, but we've got the bookings, but it may, not, may be virtual rather than, than physical. But it's, I think it's such a good way to sort of uh, start with the children because children are inherently, I mean, they're, they're just born with this natural sense of they want to care for things. Their instinct is to cuddle something rather than hurt it. And somewhere along that line, obviously, they learn, how to, they learn from adults that animals are disposable or that can be abused. So it's just kind of like keeping that in the head that they... You know, it's, um, but I think it's, it sounds absolutely fantastic what, you, what you're describing. It sounds absolutely brilliant. You raise a very good point because it also, you know, the kids, as you say, they're just like big sponges of learning. And then they go back to their parents and talk to their parents, you know, and as I say, in a country where there's so much um, rabies concern, now suddenly they're saying to their parents, you know, we know how to approach a dog safely, not to be frightened of, of dogs out in the community. Mm. Um, you know, and just, just, you know, working with government officials as well, um, 
oh goodness, working, uh, holding uh, companion animal conferences for governments and NGOs to get together in the same room, helping the NGOs to upgrade their facilities, their dog and cat rescue centers. Um, and, and what I wanted to say at the beginning was all of this has come through, again, using that word holistically, to the point that in May of this year, China actually removed dogs from the livestock list, which means that dogs and by default cats who were never on the list to begin with, um, it's, it's no longer legal now to sell cats or dogs as food for the table so once we can get onto that trajectory you know we can start talking about other animals that are on the food table and how their intelligence and emotional integrity equates to that of dogs and cats and how we should be treating all life much much better not just in China of course but the world over yeah yeah so how far do you think that the biopharma industry has come has come in terms of recognizing the damage they do and the coolie that they cause um, I know you've briefly sort of touched on what, what biofarm actually is, um, and you know, but could you tell us how you're working with the industry to look at alternatives? And I know it's a cultural issue where, where people are putting their faith in traditional med medicines, but there are plant-based alternatives as well. But also there's a the financial aspect as well as kind of, you know, um, we get accused of trying to take dairy farmers jobs and, you know, and beef farmers jobs without giving them a, like a viable alternative. But we know obviously that there are alternatives. It's just kind of getting the support, the, the emotional support and the financial support available to them as well. So in terms of the biofarming industry and the culture around it and the support to change to something else, how, we, how, we, how is Animals Asia working with, with, the, with the industry? Yeah, it's a good question. It's all about solutions, really. And I think, you know, the one country to highlight is obviously Vietnam, where we've seen enormous success over these years. I mean, we've been working on this, this vile industry since, um, you know, as I said, since the early 1990s. Um, and, you know, especially with the traditional medicine community, um, and, you know, who obviously sell and prescribe bare bile. And we've been working um, extremely hard with those in, with the main association in Vietnam, with about 70,000 members um, of the traditional medicine association. Um, and by the end of this year, they've promised not to sell or prescribe bare bile anymore and to move towards the herbal alternatives. And the way that we can support that is by helping to the development of herbal gardens that, that, that sell the plant-based alternatives to bare bile. And currently there's now um, 13 um, such gardens, herbal gardens across the country. So again, it's a really nice win-win you know, situation for the doctors and for Animals Asia and the bears, of course, themselves. Um, and in tandem with that, we've also got a memorandum of understanding with the Vietnam government mm -hmm. that bear bark farming will officially end um, altogether by the year 2022. So, you know, we've got 438 bears that are going to need help um, you know, over this time, but we're very determined to do that. And of course, the onus is on us to build another sanctuary. We already have one in China, one in Tam Dao in Vietnam. We now need to build another sanctuary in Vietnam to help as many of those 400 or so bears that we can. But again, it's all about win-win and helping the government and helping the local community and, you know, all the stakeholders basically in the industry to bring something to an end that doesn't cause suffering for the government, for the reputation of the country, or indeed for the bears themselves. Yeah, that, that sounds absolutely amazing. I mean, you, you, you're right. It's it's kind of like the approach you have to take. It's it's. I think it's a slower approach. It's, it's the same as kind of. I mean, we're doing this on a much smaller scale, but it's a it's a slower approach um, because you can kind of like go in and rescue a few bears. But actually, the education part of it is 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 really really vital. You've got to you know you know get people to understand why it's the wrong thing to do uh, without damaging the reputation you know it's kind of like they want us to be seen as a you know as a world player on the, on the stage on the world stage they don't kind of you know um so i think that's really really important it's um yeah, yeah. Couldn't be more right, Anna. Um, just one other thing on the traditional medicine side is we, um, you know, our team have a clinic every month where they, you know, they invite um, traditional medicine doctors to come along and give lectures about bare bile and the herbal alternatives. Um, and they've even produced a rubbing alternative. It's like a little bottle of rubbing solution oh, because yeah. in Vietnam slightly different for bruises um, so they give out free samples to the local and it's usually the elderly in the local community that have been using bare bile and they'll come along to these free clinics they'll talk to the, do the doctors they'll get their free samples of bare rubbing solution for their bruises and things and they'll realize that it's actually making a difference without harming bears you know and ironically a couple of weeks ago we had one of these clinics and a, and a bear farmer came along mm -hmm. he said he actually said he had bad back pain for many years he'd been using bare bile um, and, and that wasn't working Working, and he now wanted to know what rubbing solution we were using in the herbal alternative. So, it, you know, it's crazy, really. And, it, it, you know, and we get the kids coming along to these clinics because they're brought along by their families. So we have like a kid's corner as well. 
and very often these kids you know they they their parents are, are bare bar farmers so once we can talk with the kids about you know even having competitions drawing competitions bringing them along to see the bears and things at the sanctuary they'll go back to their parents and talk about how um you know distasteful their their parents industry is and we've we've had farmers giving up their bears because of their children in the past as well so it's you know it's very far reaching some of the programs yeah. I think we I think we shouldn't underestimate I mean none of us should underestimate how important the children's role in, 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 is in this um, I mean I'm absolutely blown away when I'm here I mean I've got friends who've got vegan babies and vegan toddlers now you know and you would never have heard of that 10 years ago and I just think it's absolutely amazing because we are building slowly slowly but surely we are building a vegan and an, an animal animal kind world you know I, I know it's going to take a long long time but you can see the progress can't you you really can. I've never seen anything like it, you know, and even in this neck of the woods, you know, I'm sadly on lockdown in Hong Kong at the moment. I can't get to China or Vietnam, but the amount of plant based alternatives now, restaurants and, you know, shops that are opening up, it's absolutely incredible. And this is going now into China. You know, we've got sort of mainstream restaurants like Kentucky in China that are selling plant based nuggets now, you know, just just stuff like that is, is you know, you can you can tell that, you know, people are becoming more and more sort of in with a plant-based diet and trying it and and of course it's all about the taste isn't it Let, yes. let's face it at the end of the day and if they've got things that are familiar with them that still taste good why wouldn't they go over to a plant-based alternative you know when it's so much better for you and the planet yeah. we, we, we talked briefly just before we started recording about the, the um, obviously the camels in our in our area and i know that there's a lot of hypocrisy in the uk where you know we're kind of up in arms about um we hear things about the Yulin Festival and, you know, in the Asian countries sort of eating dogs and cats. I know you said that the fish <laughs> off, the, off the, li the list now, but they don't give a, th a thought to any other animals in the meat trees, you know, cows and pigs and things uh, and other animals, some same things, but other, you know, sort of uh, other creatures who get, who get used in the, in, the, in the meat trade. So what do you think that we need to do to, to, as activists to encourage people to make the connection? Um, because it is a hard one. It's, it's, it's constant, you know, the friends, not food. It's the pigs are the same as, as cows, are the same as dogs are the same as cats sort of thing, you know. I, I completely agree. And this is where I'd love you to have Dave on on your program as well, yeah. because he has a lot of lectures, you know, particularly in this neck of the woods mm -hmm. in Asia. Um, in China and Vietnam, and he does very convincing arguments. You know, mm. one of my favorite sayings is, is, is how is it that one intelligent, um, emotionally aware animal finds its way into our hearts? And that's of course the dog. And when another emotionally intelligent aware animal finds its way into our freezer, and that's of course, you know, domestically reared animals. And I think as long as we can provide that sort of link as to the emotional um, integrity and the intelligence mm. of intelligence, raised animals mm. you know I'm still I mean the thing that changed me was was seeing the film Earthlings I have to say yeah. Yeah. Um, and just learning more about the sentience and the intelligence of these animals and and the fact you know when you take a dairy calf away from its mother so that that mother's milk can you know be milk for us the only you know the only species on the planet that takes milk from another animal you know um, and you see those pictures and those video films in real life of a cow bawling for her calf and a calf bawling for his mum. And that calf that we know is going to be sent off to slaughter um, if he's a male because he has no sort of function in the dairy trade at all anyway. Um, I just think that sort of stuff is, is, is so compelling and, and it just shows us up to be a species that has got this so wrong, frankly, over these years. Um, you know, I heard someone talking about the, you know, the, 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 the chickens the other day um, and how day old chicks, you know, uh, are humanely dispatched, um, you know, if they're, they're not females. So, and, and, and then they're showing this grinder and, and it was like, you know, we, we have to get a life. We have to really be informed about this industry so that we can then make conscious and intelligent um, decisions ourselves based on facts, you know, not based on what the industry wants us to believe, you know, where you've got happy cows munching their way through grass before being slaughtered. This, this is just so wrong at every level, you know, and no, no, no wonder I think that th this is being exposed as it really should be now after so long, you know, we've got to get our facts straight um and we've got to start looking at humane care and management now i think um i mean two two points there of like of chickens and cows i mean um we we did an outreach on uh, on the life of of chickens and we used the um there's a, a hen called poppy poppy the hen it's actually just it's a facebook friend who reckon who rescues uh, ex-battery hens ex-cage farm hens 
and um, and the horrendous state she was in, and now what she's like with a, with you know a few days TLC, you know, she's being free you know for fifty days. So we used her as an example of the horrendous chicken industry, and we use and obviously we talked about the macerators and the so called humane way of of get, of killing these these beautiful little, little birds. But we also do the, um, the saves, you know, the, the vigils outside of slaughterhouses. There's, there's one next week, and um, that's really important. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, it, it's a it's a frustrating one because you know you can't go in and save the animals. You, it's, there's literally nothing you can do but stand there and take photographs and tell the story. But I think it's important to us as activists to see. It's a bit like you kind of describing that story that you know the, the not story to the, the truth of the bear holding your hand, putting reaching out, because it's emotional connection which, which makes you a stronger activist because you've seen it, and you can speak their truth. You can say that we've seen this, you know, with uh, with people who who don't believe you, the farmers who come up to you, and you 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 know you've seen this, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's 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 so deeply disturbing at so many levels. I, I'm sorry I could just go on about this all day. You know we're not sort of set up to address the the intensive farming industry, but it's certainly something that we should as a species be considering now and 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 really changing our habits. Really change. We have to do things differently. You know just in terms of our safety as well, if people are not even thinking about the animal safety, you know, the disease that comes out of these places, you know, mm. where, where animals are raised for, for our food. We've, we've yes. just, it, you know, we're looking at, at COVID now, yeah. you know, a gut and, and, you know, so many diseases, the majority of zoonotic disease, you know, diseases that are coming out are, are zoonotic. So mm. it's, uh, it's very scary. Well, actually, the, the next thing I was going to ask was about the people are not getting the links between, um, you know, the, the, our treatment of wildlife and um, and coronavirus, you know, emergence of diseases like coronavirus. I know Peter, when I was talking to Peter Regan, he was saying the same thing. He said that he went over to the wet markets and he was just absolutely horrified by what he was yeah. seeing. Um, and it's hard to kind of get pe people kind of like agree. The man on the street will agree that you that they have come from wet markets and they'll blame certain countries for the emergence of them. But actually... They don't do anything about it they, they kind of like say yes that's the reason but actually what is the solution where we don't want to have, have any part in the solution you know because it means we've got to make a change um yeah. it's uh, so so what are your thoughts on, on kind of like the, the links i mean how are you kind of you know sort of it's inextricably linked there's no question about it i mean we've been investigating these awful markets for decades now literally dec myself since the mid 1980s and they never 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 change we should be careful about calling them wet markets i think we should be we're better calling them wild animal markets or live animal markets um just because wet markets here in hong kong for example are a feature of day-to-day -day life you know where they sell flowers and groceries oh, and fresh right. vegetables and fruits and things um yes there are meat cuts as well but it's not we don't have um, things like sort of um, live wild animals and dogs and cats as we have you know obviously in other countries in in asia um but when you've got these these animals these different animals together in this what is literally a melting pot of disease there's no question that you've got a perfect vector for bacterial transmission and that's exactly what's been happening in these in these live animal markets you know over these decades um and it i, I just find it so um Oh, I don't know, just astonishing, really, um, that, you know, it's yes, it's costing millions, if not billions to get around COVID now, you know, for everyone to get through this, for sure, it's going to cost billion, you know, um, sorry, it's going to cost actually trillions to get through this, but actually it will cost, you know, billions to put the, the whole um, you know, to reset, if you like, the, the live animal markets, to, to start closing those down, compensating people fairly, and then sort of setting the marker, if you like, for us to be able to live a much cleaner and happier life um, without the fear of disease. So that's exactly what's got to happen. We've got to close these places down because they are, they are certainly already killing us and they're just opening a pathway for many, many more COVID-19s to follow, you know, in its wake. Yeah. So... We were. Um, I know. I know. Um, you've obviously been working with animals for a long time, um, and I've been. I've been sort of like doing animal rights for you know. I mean, in a different sort of way, but for, since I was a child, sort of like 14, 15, and I was vegetarian when I was fourteen, up until ten years ago when I turned vegan. So, what was it? What made, made you make the connection between you know sort of uh, wanting to be vegan and just before you were vegan, sort of you know making the change? Well, yeah, I, I can remember. Do you know what? I can remember. 
going vegan. I actually can't remember the year, but it must have been about 15 years ago. Um, and it was when I was watching Earthlings. So the producer of Earthlings had just been over to China to say hello and, and recalled um, some film for the second film that he was making, Sean Monson, who incidentally I met in LA in March again. We went on Pig Save. I joined him for Pig Save. You talk about the, the save, you know, and, and I was I was just broken hearted, you know, jo joining them in the streets. They were so civil and courteous when the trucks were coming in, you know, with the pigs. The drivers were amazing. They were stopping for a few seconds seconds so that everyone could you know give water to the pigs um, and the police were around as well without any sort of hint of antagonism or anything so it was it was amazing anyway Sean put this film Earthlings together if none of your you know I, I, I'm sure some of your listeners will have will have seen it but mm. I urge those who haven't to please please watch it because it is literally life-saving and it turned me pretty much vegan overnight it was the most awful thing that I've ever seen. And it, it's hard to look. You know, it's one of those films that you, you can't unsee once you've seen it. But it's so compelling and it's so truthful that you, you walk away and thinking, you know, oh, my goodness, I've been responsible for this. And, and you can't live, you can't literally live with your, your conscience anymore. Yeah. I mean, when you were talking there about earthlings, I can kind of remember the certain things that you said you can't unsee. I can remember certain sounds and certain, like, looks of the animals and everything you, you, you just can't it's literally it's just in your head all the time certain things just trigger trigger the memories again you know um so what is it about bears then i mean is it have bears just sort of like found you or did you find bears or what's the uh, i know obviously you, you you've talked about the one which left the, the mark on you but what is it about bears that you appreciate and you know and, and get Oh, every every year, every rescue, every second, you know, we just learn more and more about these these incredible species. Mm -hmm. They are phenomenal. You know, the fact that they're so forgiving after literally anything up to 30 years of being confined in a tiny wire cage, being surgically mutilated, having teeth and claw tips cut back, you know, being so appallingly treated and yet once you get them back to the sanctuary and you start giving them good nutritional food you take their pain away through surgery and medical intervention and you get them out into gra grassy enclosures where you're you know encouraging them to play with newfound friends it's the most incredible thing to see and it's just to see what gentle beautiful creatures they are you know and charismatic as well they make you laugh like hell you know they'll they'll turn you know they'll turn a somersault just because they can it, they have an enormous sense of mischief and mischievousness and and fun in their hearts and you know we have trouble keeping up with all the different enrichment and toys and and entertainment programs that we put out for them in the enclosures um to keep them busy and happy and occupied you know it's no mean feat looking after a bear i have to say but it's something that gives us great great joy to do and satisfaction and it opens the doors to visitors to come and see um this mega fauna you know this this mega species you know in front of their eyes and and they want to protect them too so it's a lovely well-rounded program again where we work win-win with the local communities and governments so with all, with all the things you see i mean you've already just described some horrendous things you've seen how do you deal with your own mental health and your well-being i mean how do you do you have to take yourself away sometimes or do you kind of you know have a good support network how do you how do you manage well you've just heard me gush about the bears and one thing <laughs> you know when i'm on site in china and vietnam i'll grab the walkie-talkie sometimes and i'll go online to our to our team and i'll just say i'm going to turn the walkie-talkie off for about half an hour i need to go and have a meeting with ozzy and of course ozzy's one of our bears you know and it's just you know nothing beats that than taking a few illegal treats in my pocket and going around to the den area and feeding ozzy or you know or kevin or the or nicole whatever you know the bears and just spending a few you know minutes quality time with them and reflecting on how absolutely lucky we are just how lucky we are to be working with them and and ultimately hopefully um setting the path now for ending bear bar farming once and for all yeah i mean your face just lit up there and you were beaming when, when, when i was asking you about the bears you know it was just just lovely it's just obviously you, you completely get them you know it's, it's just the sound amazing animals i've never sort of like been anywhere near to, uh, to a bear but it, they just sound amazing creatures they're ridiculous they just make you laugh you know because the, the young ones they just get really opinionated you know and they they take on each other like sumo wrestlers you know <laughs> and the older 
ones that you know have far gone beyond that you know and they you know they've come through a lot they're arthritic they've got bad mobility problems but they play in slow motion with each other and that's the sweetest funniest thing to see them as well just rolling around slowly you know or as quickly as they can you know in what we call bare bundles of play so it, it just really opens your eyes, I think, to the, the magnificence of other species with whom we share our lives. And we've certainly chosen one of the most charismatic, I'm sure of that. <laughs> so how can how can us listening in the UK, how can we help animals like your bears and the dogs and the cats and the, you know, the captive animals you work with? What can we do to help you? Oh, please, please just join us. You know, we are so excited because, again, as I said, you know, with cats and, and dogs off the livestock list now, we've achieved one of the goals for which we were founded. There's not many NGOs can say that, you know, and, and the same with bears in Vietnam, ending bear farming by 2022. That's two of the goals, you know, and we just, just, just need your help, you know, as much as you can give us, please, to, um, to join us, um, you know, go online, see what we're doing, become a monthly member of Animals Asia um, so that we can start raising much needed funds to build another sanctuary in Vietnam where we can close this industry there once and for all and really show a significant example to other bear bar farming countries, you know, and especially, you know, where we work in China as well. So it's just a case of, of please helping and supporting Animals Asia as, as much as you can or as little as you can. It doesn't matter, every single penny counts as you, as you guys know. So, and uh, yeah, and uh, you know, and say good luck with your, with your work as well you're doing phenomenal stuff there on the ground i know how difficult it is and i just hope people can you know find enough kindness in their hearts which is the new slogan for our new campaign the only cure is kindness let's just be kind let's be kind to each other you know i hope people kindly support you and kindly support animals asia as well well actually one of the t-shirts i've got on it is it's a, it's a vegan is a, vegan is a state of kind <laughs> so, oh, oh that's so nice like sort of continues the theme but you're right it is it's just Kindness. It's kindness is the root of everything, really, isn't it? Uh, yeah. It's been absolutely delightful talking to you today. It's been so uplifting. It's been really, really an absolute pleasure. So thank you very much. Um, really, really do appreciate you give, giving up your time uh, to do this. And I know obviously there'll be loads of people wanting to listen and, and, uh, and watch the, the, the video. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you very much, uh, Jill Robinson, for, for sparing us your precious time and talking to us about your fantastic bears. Um, this is Anna, Anna Amelia from Northeast Animal Rights signing off now. Um, so goodbye for now, and we'll catch up with you later. Thanks so much.